and thanks for joining us for Easter Online. My name is Andrew and I lead our online team here at LifeGate Church. And it's great to have you joining us today. If this is your first time, I just want to quickly explain how it all works. Um, It's not scary. LifeGate Church Online, you can watch and engage in two ways. Either you can put it on your TV or for the full interactive experience, you can head to www.lifegate.online and you can uh, chat with other people. You can read the Bible along uh, with the message. You can uh, request prayer by clicking the request prayer button. And what this does is it opens up a private one-on-one chat that's confidential with one of our team, and we'd love to support you to do the journey. So that's two ways that you can engage. Another way that you can engage and get connected with our incredible online community is you can click the link that says Join Facebook Group. And what this is, it's a private Facebook group with members of our online community who want to connect, want to encourage one another throughout the week, And we want to support you not only one day of the week, but seven days of the week as well. Um, So we're going to get into our Easter service today in a minute, but I just wanted to share a quick encouragement uh, with you. So um, two weeks ago, we celebrated one year of online church. And so last week, all of our team got together to celebrate, to come up with uh, some ways forward where we want to Uh, lead this community and the ways that we want to grow this going forwards. And out of that meeting came some really awesome, encouraging stuff that I'm going to share with you um, and I'm going to share with the whole church uh, in a few weeks' time. And so be excited for that. I'm excited for it. I'm excited what God is doing within our community and what he's going to continue to do. And so... Today we're celebrating Easter, we're celebrating and remembering what uh, God has done for us through Jesus and through the cross. And so I just want to pray and then we're going to get into our service. So Father, we thank you so much for what Jesus did for us on the cross. We thank you that uh, you came into this world so that each and every person could live a new life with you so that people could discover freedom from the things of the past that can hold us back and cause us to feel stuck. And God, you have a great purpose for each and every one of us moving forwards. And so we just pray as we celebrate Jesus today, we pray that you would help us to remember what he has done and be inspired and respond to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've got an awesome service today. Hope you enjoy it. We're going to check out life this week and we're going to hear what's happening within our church and then we're going to go into the message. Enjoy. This is Life This Week. Welcome to LifeGate Church Online. We encourage you to join our online Facebook group designed specifically for our online church community. There are 168 hours in a week and church is only one hour. This Facebook group is an opportunity to stay connected and encouraged throughout the week. To join the group, head to lifegate.org.au forward slash online. If you're able, why don't you check out one of our physical locations in Padstow and Preston's in Sydney. The details are on our website. Our team would love to pray with you during online church. You can receive prayer by pressing the request prayer button at any point during the service. This will open up a private chat where you can receive prayer via messaging. Finally, we would like to thank you for your financial giving. Your generosity helps to impact many lives and see people live in the freedom and purpose that Jesus has for their lives. There are two ways to give online, via tithely or by bank transfer. If you would like to give, head to our website. It has all the details. That's it for Life This Week. Good morning, everyone. Big, big, big Sunday today. As you guys make your way back to your seats, I want to extend a warm welcome and a hello to those that are online. And I want to say hello to those that are actually watching at Preston's who are watching live. 
this Sunday morning as well. It is so exciting to be up here. It is so exciting to be speaking on this awesome and huge day. Hey, I want you to uh, give the person next to you a high five, a tap, something, and tell them that Jesus is alive. Could I get the clicker guys as well? Give me a moment. <laughs> Some technical difficulties early this morning. Forget something. Here we go. Jesus is alive. For thousands of years, God's purpose and plan of salvation for his people all culminates at this period in time that Jesus died in our place for our sins and that he rose again for our salvation. And I want to talk about this, this truth of what, what it means for the resurrection in two ways. I want to look at it in two things. One, what does it mean if Christ did or did not rise from the grave? So what does it mean? And two, how do we know that he came back to life? So one, what does it mean? And two, how do we know that he actually came back to life? All right, the first one, what does it mean? Today we find ourselves in the most important belief of the Christian faith. It's Easter Sunday today, Christ has risen, and it's Resurrection Sunday. Now, I'm not talking about this here. We're not talking about resuscitation. It's not 30 pumps, a couple of breaths, and a defibrillator where somebody comes back to life, and then later on they go to die. That's not what happened. On, Easter, uh, on, on Good Friday, we learned that Jesus Christ was hung on a cross, that he was crucified, and that he died, and that a, a professional executor declared him to be dead. They pulled him down, they wrapped him in linen and spices, and they put him in a tomb without any medical care or no attention for three days. And on the third day, he rose from the grave, conquering Satan, sin, de hell, death, and the wrath of God. Amen? Amen? Never to die again, ruling and reigning over all people, all nations, all tribes, King of kings, and the Lord of lords. The Christian faith literally hinges on whether or not Jesus come back to life. And if he did not rise from the grave, then everything that we are doing here is a waste of time. It's a strong statement, isn't it? If Jesus Christ did not rise from the grave, everything that we are doing here is a waste of time. I want to have a look at how the Apostle Paul says it. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. What am I doing up here preaching to you this morning if Christ has not been risen? And your faith is in vain. It's useless. It has no point. The fact that you are here listening to me, well, I feel sorry for you if that's the case. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and that you are still in your sins. For Christianity, we believe that we are all sinners and that Jesus Christ went to the cross to die in our place for our sins because sin separates us from the love of God. It separates from the relationship of God. And when we put our trust in Jesus... Uh, all, of, all of the perfection and all of the love of Jesus Christ and all of his goodness is put on us and all our sins are put on Jesus. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see us as sinful, but he sees us as sinless. But if Christ did not rise from the grave, then we are still dead in our sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Obviously, Paul has gone and shared the gospel with others and they believed and now they have died. Well, if Christ didn't rise, then they're gone too, that they're not going to rise from the grave either. And if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are, mo we are of all people most to be pitied. You know, maybe some of you here say that people come to the Christian faith when they're feeling down, maybe they're weak, maybe they're going through a tough time, oh, then, then I'm going to choose Jesus. And what the Apostle Paul says, if, that you, if that you use Christ only for a moment in your life, that if Christ is some kind of tack on, or some sort of you know, thing that you go to from time to time in order to get through your life. Well, he says here that you are most to be pitied. But, but if Jesus really did come back from life, then it is the ultimate representation of his claim to be in God because he constantly, emphatically, unapologetically, and consistently declared that he was, in fact, Lord. Look at this verse here from John chapter 10. But Jesus responded, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of your good works, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Have you ever thought about why they actually murdered Jesus? Like we know that he was sinless. We know that he was perfect. Even if you don't believe that Jesus was God, you'd pretty much still say, well, he was a pretty good person. He taught us some good things. So why in the world did they crucify him? 
And they crucified him because he constantly taught that he was God and that he was God and that he was the resurrected king, that he was the Messiah that they were waiting for. And they absolutely hated this. If you declared to be God and you weren't, it was blasphemy. And they tried stoning Jesus for it, but they didn't get to stone him. They murdered him on a cross. I want to look at some statements that theologian Gerardo Collins says about the resurrection. He says this, The resurrection is the supreme of Jesus' divine identity and his inspired word. I think I've gone too far here. Here we go. I'll start from here. In a profound sense, Christianity without the resurrection is not simply Christianity at all. It's a pretty big claim, isn't it? In a profound sense, Christianity without the resurrection is not simply Christianity at all. Without its final chapter, it is not Christianity. What he's saying is if you take away the resurrection, you can get rid of Christianity altogether. Because Christianity is not, it is not about what we do for God, but it's about what God has done for us. And maybe, maybe some of you are here thinking, hang on a second, why should we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Didn't he, didn't he say some pretty good things? Didn't he do some pretty good things? Didn't he teach us to love people and to encourage people and to serve and to help the poor and all those kind of things? Yes, he did. But that's not, that's not what Christianity is about. It's not about being a better person or how we can live our best life today or how we can work towards, towards world peace or what you do for God, but rather it's about the person of Jesus and the work that he accomplished on the cross of Calvary. The second thing is the resurrection is the supreme of Jesus' divine identity and his inspired teaching. The resurrection proves that Jesus was God and everything that he said was true. It proves that he was God and everything that he said was true. For if Jesus didn't rise from the grave, then he's just another dead religious leader and everything that he said is useless and that we would just be making a pilgrimage to a grave in which he sits. But the truth is, as Christians, where do we go? We don't go anywhere. We don't make a pilgrimage because Jesus' body is not in the grave. He is risen from the dead. And here is but a handful of Jesus-inspired teaching about himself. Remember, it proves that he was God and that his inspired teaching is in fact real. And I had so many of them and I had to cut it short, but here is a handful. He is the Son of God, he says. He says, I am the Son of Man. He says, I am the giver of eternal life. He says, I am the future judge, the saviour of the world, the Messiah, which means the anointed one by God. And I love this claim here that Jesus says about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Well, hang in a second, Jesus. Are you saying that it's not about my performance to connect with God? Nope. Are you saying it's not about my reality to connect with God? Nope. Are you saying it's not about how many times I come to church or serve at church on a Sunday? No. Are you saying that if my, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, that somehow I, I, I get to connect with God? No, because it's not about you, but it's about him. And Jesus says that only through him is the way to the Father. Only through him is the connection that we have with God. It's belief in Jesus. Next. The resurrection is the proof of the triumph over sin and death. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. That was the song that we sung today. What is finished? The power of sin and death has no hold over you and me. When you believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven and you have eternal life. And this is only made possible through the cross. You see, the cross without the resurrection doesn't work. But when the cross and the resurrection come together, that's where the power is. Next, it's the foreshadowing of the resurrection of his followers, and it's the basis of Christian hope. Here he is saying that because Jesus rose from the grave, you and I will rise too. And it is the hope that we can have. It is the future that we can look forward to. It is the vision that we can have for our lives. It is what we can ground ourselves in. It is what we can sink our teeth into, and it is what we can hold on to. Because no matter how bad life gets today, no matter how crazy things become. And it, and it doesn't take much to look into society and think, man, something has gone terribly wrong. But the good news is this. 
that one day we too will rise at Christ's rise and Jesus will wipe every tear from our eyes and there will be no pain, there will be no sorrow and there will be no suffering and we will get to live with him for eternity. Isn't that a great place to ground your hope in here? And lastly, or rather I should say here from John 11, here's his claim about that. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who believes in me shall never die. The question is whether or not you're going to die, because you are. The question is not what do you believe and where you will be for eternity. And for those that believe in Jesus, we go to be with him. Lastly, and this is the big one, it is the miracle of all miracles. It is the miracle of all miracles. I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 27, but let me set up the scene. This is at the place where Jesus was hanging on the cross. And because it was a publicly and shamefully thing that was done, people are just walking past him and they're seeing what's happening. And it says, those who passed by hurtled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. This is another statement that shows that Jesus continually and always said that he was God because regular people are saying, well, if you are God, why don't you save yourself? Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. Isn't that a great question? If you are God, why don't you come down and save yourself? How many of you have heard this or maybe have said this? God, if you're all-powerful, why don't you do this? God, if you're all-loving, why did you allow this to happen? God, if you're out there, why don't you change the situation? Why don't you make this better? And, it's, and it's, a fair, it's a fair question, but I want to say this. Even though we might not understand what's going on, even though we might not understand what's happening in that point of time, I want to say that God has got a plan, that God is working all things to the good of those who love him according to his purpose. In other translations, it says his plan. And that's what was happening here at the cross. They're saying to Jesus, well, if you're a God, why don't you do something about it? But God had a plan. Let me ask you a question, and I want you to to discuss it for a couple of moments amongst each other. Would it have been better to come down from the cross or to come up from the grave? Would it have been better for Jesus to have come down from the cross or to come up from the grave? I want you to discuss it, and I want you to tell me why. Take a few moments. All right, I probably don't want to give you too much time because I'm hoping it's the obvious one and I haven't shot myself in the foot. But uh, just shout them out. Which one is it? We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for... If he stayed on the cross, we wouldn't be here. What else? What else did you discuss? It was prophesied that he would raise up from the grave. Amen. What else? Was it better for him to come down from the cross or raise or come up from the grave? Anyone else? Give you hope. Absolutely. What well, is the proof that Jesus is who he said he was? And if he is God and the things that he said, that you have to take him seriously and you have to make a choice. Either he was in fact God or he wasn't. And the resurrection, I believe, is the absolute pinnacle of him being the Lord. I'll move on to my second question about talking about the resurrection, and it's this. How do we know that Jesus actually came back to life? And there's four things that I want to look at. The first thing is influence. The second thing is family. The third thing is movement. And the fourth thing is transformation. Now, by no means are these the biggest and most important things that you can look at in order to know this is something that I've put together. But if you actually do your research on the amount of evidence and facts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we have, it is unbelievable. It stacks up so high. If you are here and you're listening and you're online or you're at Preston's and you don't believe that Jesus actually is God and that he was raised from the dead, just do your research and I can guarantee you that you will have a mind-blowing experience. 
Because most people that do that end up going from atheism to believing in Jesus. But here are four things that I'm hoping that if you're a Christian and you've chosen to believe, it'll just give you that extra strength to stand on. And if you're not, well, maybe it'll just give you something to question. So the first thing is this, influence. Nobody has influenced the world as much as Jesus. Jesus has had more of an impact on the world than anybody else who has ever lived. Just look at our historical calendar like Why do we use Jesus Christ at the focal point in which history revolves around? And what I mean by that is B.C. and A.D. You know, when you're in history class and they're talking about 500 B.C., 1200 B.C., they're talking about 500 years before the birth of Jesus, B.C., before Christ. And anything after the birth of Jesus is A.D., Anno Domini, which is Latin for the year of the Lord. Now, I'm wondering why they didn't use any other religious leaders or have a crack at it. I was thinking, maybe why didn't they use B.M., before Muhammad? AA, the year of Allah. No, nah, he didn't get a look in. What about BB, before Buddha? AR, the year of reincarnation. Nope. What about this other guy that's actually BC as well, before Confucius? AU, the year of the universe. How about this one? BA, before atheism, AB, the year of the bang. We don't use any of that, but you get what I'm saying, right? That history literally revolves around the birth of Jesus Christ and we celebrate it every year that is known as Christmas. And then we also celebrate the death, burial and resurrection, which we call Easter. And that is the period that we are in right now. We celebrate that every year. More songs have been written to him. More songs have been sung to him. More paintings painted of him. More books written regarding him. And more lives devoted to him around the world than anybody else in the history of the world. I mean, look at the Bible. The Bible is the number one selling book year in, year out. In fact, it sells so many copies that they had to remove it from the list because any other book that has been written will not make it to number one. Isn't that incredible? Actually, it was interesting when I was reading it, when I was uh, researching this. The only book that comes somewhere near the actual best-selling book, of, which is Scripture, is the Harry Potter books. Does anybody read Harry Potter? Maybe a couple of you. But they say that Harry Potter has sold somewhere between 500 to 800 million copies. That is quite a bit. But only the Bible has made it to the Guinness Book of Records. And they say they estimate, they don't actually know, and it could be way more, they estimate up to 5 billion copies of Scripture has been sold. For all you math nerds, that equates to 2.5 million a year, somewhere close to around about 7,000 copies a day. 7,000 copies of the Bible a day. And you know who the Bible's all about? Jesus. Did you guys have decaf this morning? What is going on? I don't, I don't know. I'm not hearing you. Hopefully online and at Preston, you guys are shouting it out a little louder. But yes, the Bible is all about Jesus. But you get what I'm saying. There is nobody bigger and there is nobody better than Jesus. Amen. There is nobody bigger and there is nobody better than Jesus. He has influenced the world more than anybody in the history of the world. And that just is astonishing. Secondly, how do we know that Jesus came back to life? But I want to look at his family, and this is, this is pretty cool. How many of you have got brothers? How many of you got a uh, twin brother, brother from another mother, half-brother, whatever it looks like? Can I get a show of hands? What would it take for you to worship your brother as Lord? Like, what, what would it take for you to worship your brother as Lord? Now, probably some of you are thinking, man, if only I told the authorities about what my brother did to me, he'd probably be in juvenile detention, right? Because brothers can be a little bit chaotic at times, and that was actually me when I was growing up. Ever, ever notice, uh, seen one of these before? This is a cap gun. When I was a kid, I used to love these things. I, I, I just feel, I, I just always want, I just love the sound that it makes, and I'd just be shooting off away, but I was quite naughty when I was a kid. If you notice at the front of the tip, there's like a little cap on it, And I used to think to myself, I wonder what that's there for. I wonder if anything comes out of the front of it. So I'd go to my grandfather's tool shop and I just would grab anything I could, a knife or a a drill or something, and I'd be trying to rip it off or poke a hole in it. And eventually I'd bore the hole out. And I'm like, okay, took a few shots at my hand and something actually did pop out. So what I would do is I'd go and find my sister. She'd be sitting on the floor watching TV in the shots and I'd be running around in circles and I would just be firing off this gun and she'd be losing it at me and just yelling at me. But that was me as a younger brother. It was pretty bad. But what would it take for my sister to worship me as God? You know, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, no matter how good I am, if I came back to life, that just might cut it. But this is what happens to Jesus and his brothers. In John chapter 7, it says 
that his brothers did not believe him. Before Christ came, rose from the grave, his brothers did not believe him. But after the resurrection, it goes on to say that James became a pastor of a church in Jerusalem, that he authored the New Testament epistle bearing his name. He was actively involved in shaping the early church in which he went on to suffer and die for proclaiming that Jesus Christ, his brother, was Lord. Now I want to look at Mary. Any mums in the room? Hands up if you're a mother. Um, there's a couple of you out there. I'm wondering what it would take for you to worship your kids as Lord. Now maybe some of you are hoping if they just brought you breakfast to bed, that just might cut it, right? Maybe some <laughs> eggs and some toast, a cup of coffee, that just might get you over the line for a day. But Jesus' mother even worshipped him as God. Now Jesus, so rather Mary experienced Jesus on the cross. She saw him die she saw the painful death, and this would have been absolutely horrific. But we read in Acts chapter 1, verses 14, it says, All these were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and the Mary, together with the women and Mary, mother of Jesus and his brothers. This comes at a point where Jesus has come back from the grave. He's shown himself to, to tens, to hundreds of people, to his mom, to his brothers, and he says to them, Hey, don't get started yet. Wait till I ascend to the kingdom and I'm going to send a helper, the Holy Spirit. So they all go back and they're sitting in this room and they're all praying to Jesus. Now, you know, when the Bible says that Mary was praying to Jesus, it's not just this kind of fluffy, oh, my son. and that. No, no, it's actually them praying and believing that her son was, in fact, God. What would convince Jesus' family? I mean, you just you laughed when I asked what would it take to worship your kids or, 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 or to worship your brother. It, it, it would be impossible, but something as powerful as the resurrection would do that. The third thing I want to look at is movement. If the resurrection did not happen, you are going to have an extremely hard time explaining how Christianity even got off the ground. And, and you need to think of this. Jesus willingly allowed himself to go through the most agonizing, and painful and publicly shameful execution known to man. Like here is a guy that proclaimed that some things, said some crazy things, and then if he just simply died on a cross and went to the grave, wouldn't that just dissipate his followers? Wouldn't they just kind of scatter away? Any person in that kind of pathetic condition would have never inspired his disciples to go and proclaim the message that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he rose from the grave. But that is exactly what happened. That is exactly what happened. And even to add more weight to this point, it's not as if when the disciples were going through the regions and telling people about Jesus that they were throwing flowers and that they were giving them money and that they looked like they were parading around and everything was sweet and calm. It was chaos. And they multiple times, the Roman government and the priests and the people at the time were saying, if you don't stop, we will murder you. And that's exactly what happened. So I want to have a look at the way the disciples died. When they came to the apostle Peter, or the disciple Peter, and they said to him, hey, we're going to crucify you unless you stop. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified as Jesus was. Hang me upside down. And that's how they killed him. Andrew was also crucified. James, the brother of John, was killed by the sword. Bartholomew was beheaded. Thomas was stabbed with spears. Matthew was martyred. His death is unknown how. James, Jesus' brother, was stoned. June possibly sliced up. Simon the zealot, his death is unknown. But what about this guy, John? He was one of the disciples that actually passed on naturally. But when he was told to stop preaching Jesus, they boiled him in a vat of oil. And by God's miracle, he actually didn't die. And so he kept preaching the name of Jesus, that he is the resurrected king. And so they shipped him off to a place called Patmos, a desolate island where there was nothing there. And that is the place where Jesus shows up, gives him a vision. He makes his way back to Ephesus. And that's where we get the book of Revelation. So if Christ did not come back from the grave, how do you explain such an impact on the disciples' lives? It's one thing to give your life for something that you believe in, but it's another thing to die for a lie. If the, if the apostles did not see Christ come back to life, why in the world would they suffer and die in that way for a lie? Because it wasn't. Because Jesus did, in fact, come back to life and is the Lord. How are you guys doing? You doing okay? This is my last point. Just one more. Transformation. I want to have a look at the life of the Apostle Paul, and this is absolutely extraordinary. I believe the Apostle Paul's transformation has to be one of the greatest facts, proofs, explanation 
to the reason that Jesus actually come back to life. So let me introduce you to Paul. We first get a glimpse of Paul in the book of Acts. Now, Acts is the book that we have in Scripture that describes the early church and what happens. And so we see Paul in the book of Acts, and he started out as a religious terrorist. He is the Osama bin Laden of that day. He did jihad before he did Jesus. He hated, despised, opposed, persecuted, and murdered Christians. What we see in Acts is a godly man named Stephen who is proclaiming Jesus to be God, and Paul shows up with an angry mob of men. And you know what happens to Stephen after that? Paul oversees the stoning of Stephen. Added to this, we read uh, through Acts chapter 8, and this is what Paul is doing amongst the early church and amongst the region. It says this, executions, persecution, scattered, ravaging the church, dragging men and women to prison. He would be going around asking the question, do you love Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? If you do, we might stone you, imprisonment, imprison you, or possibly even kill you. Let me just say this, that culture today is becoming increasingly, is growing increasingly more hostile to Christianity. And the cost of following Jesus is getting more expensive. If you are a child of God, you need to expect that following Jesus is going to be a price to pay. For the early church, it was payment with their life. But they knew with confidence what was, awaiting them, what was awaiting for them. They knew with confidence because they had experienced the resurrection of Jesus. Nothing was going to stop them from preaching his name because they didn't fear death because they were going to go be with him. And it continues in Acts chapter 9. This is what we read of Paul. Nothing was going to stop Paul from doing what he was trying to do. He was just persecuting Jesus and his people day in, day out. And this is what we read. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through to 2. Meanwhile... Saul, which is Paul, was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for the letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, that is Christ, whether men or women, he does not discriminate, he might take them to prison. He might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And then this is where Jesus gets involved. You know, sometimes your situation might look bigger than you think. Sometimes it's just you need a miracle in your life. You need Jesus to get involved. And right now, this is where Jesus gets involved because nothing was going to stop Paul from what he was trying to do. And so as Paul's on the road to Damascus, Jesus gets off his throne. He comes down to heaven for the second time and he knocks knocks Paul's off his horse and he blinds him. He's like, Paul, why do you persecute me? And he's thinking, who are you? I am the Lord Jesus. And at this moment, this was the transformation and changing point for the Apostle Paul. He went from persecuting Christians to loving Christians. He went from imprisoning and murdering them to pastoring them. This has got to be one of the greatest evidences that Jesus Christ is and in fact Lord. There was no other reason that someone like Paul would start to worship Jesus who he proclaimed war against. And now this is his journey after he became a Christian, after he had met the resurrected Lord. Paul started to walk up to 30 kilometers a day to proclaim the gospel. How many of you, if you got to walk five minutes to church, you wouldn't be here? That's the message that so many others despised. He was voluntarily preaching the word of God, and he had to work a second job. It's not like as if because he was Paul, he wasn't going to be persecuted. Everybody was just going to hand it to him. Yeah, no worries. We want to receive you. Absolutely not. He had to make his own way, and he was persecuted for what he believed. His preaching started riots. He spent time in prison, and they sought to kill him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and chapters 11, this is what Paul says of what he went through when he converted to become a Christian and he started to proclaim Jesus. He says this, he went through afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, sleepless nights, hunger, slander, dying, punishment, sorrowful, poor, having nothing, stripes beyond measure, and that means whippings. He was imprisoned. He says he was given 30 lashings, five times 40 minus one. And it was minus one because usually 40 lashings beat the man to death. So that means that Paul was beaten to the knee to an inch within his life Five times over. This reminds me of the movie that I watched uh, with Sylvester Stallone uh, in Rambo, where he takes his shirt off in the prison and you see the scars all over his back where he was a POW. And over the years of time, the captors would have whipped him over and over again. This would have been Paul. He would have bore the scars of someone that was beaten repeatedly for the gospel. 
He says that he was beaten three times and even stoned. The former powerful Paul who oversaw the stoning of Stephen was now the one being stoned for the, re- the very reason that Stephen was, for proclaiming Jesus. It continues. He says that he was shipwrecked for a whole night and that he was drifting in the open sea. Could you imagine that? Your boat crashes and you're shipwrecked and you're just floating around in the open sea for a whole day. He says, I have day and night perils, which means danger. Danger of water, danger of robbers, perils of my own countrymen and and, and and, and Gentiles, perils in the city, in the wilderness, on the sea, sleepless nights, hunger, thirst, cold and nakedness. You know when you're naked, you're all out. Or I should say Paul's all in. Paul's story is absolutely phenomenal. And you know what? I want to say this. That if you believe Christianity is simply a religion about power, I believe Paul's story absolutely blows that out of the water. Because before he became a Christian, he had it all. He had power, he had fame, he had control, he had everything that he needed in life. And then he becomes a Christian, and this is what happens. Why in the world would Paul transform so much? And I hope that you've got the answer today. Because Jesus is alive. Because Jesus is alive. Just before I close, I want to ask the question, where are you today? For those online and those at Preston's, where do you stand today? Have you committed your life to Jesus? Do you believe that he is the resurrected king? And if you do, that's awesome. I hope your faith has been cemented even more from what we've shared this morning. But if you haven't, my prayer is that you'd become a Christian. My prayer is that you would believe this morning. And this is how, in Romans chapter 10, verses 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, there it is, you will be saved. So if you're here this morning and you can just sense something in your spirit saying, you know what, I think think Jesus is Lord. You know what, after this, I've really been challenged. You know what, after this, I think I want to make the transformation and the change. Then I want to give you that opportunity. Just pray a simple prayer with me, declaring that Jesus is God and he will accept you. So I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want you to repeat it after me. And if and that, and, and you really believe it in your heart, then you're going to become a Christian today. And it goes something like this. So just repeat after me. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he died and that he rose again. Please forgive me for my unbelief. I confess that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that Jesus was raised from the grave. Take me to be with you from this day and forever. Amen. Can we just, can we just raise up Jesus and give him a round of applause this morning? For all those that are online, I want to say have a great, Christ, uh, great Easter, rather. <laughs> Always get those two mixed up. <laughs> um, have a great Easter. Have a great time. Uh, there's going to be some questions online. If you've got any prayer, prayers, please Put them on and somebody will be there to pray for you. For those that are at Preston's, I'm going to pass you over to the MC and he's going to close the service for you. And everybody else here, have a great Easter. Have a great time. There's going to be an Easter egg hunt, I believe, after this, and that's going to be awesome. Um, Be blessed. Enjoy.